Hi, I am Angel Rebo with Mind Dahlia TV, and we are here today with Kaliani. Hi, Kaliani, how are Hi. you? Hi, Mike. I'm great, I'm great. I'm really happy to be here. Excellent, excellent. Welcome. So, I would like to start the conversation with you, Kaliani, about what is your, the, that thing that you're most passionate about? Hmm. I think uh, what drives me is really to contribute in some form to the expansion of consciousness in the planet, you know, so that we can coexist in peace. And, and there's so many different ways in which I've opened myself to let that happen, so. And how are you contributing to this increase of level of consciousness in the planet? Well, initially, um, what came to me in a living vision was to create conscious media, which is to talk about and produce documentaries and content in, in, in ways that would bring a conversation and information to people that doesn't come through regular media. So I've always been really uh, fond of a uh, documentary. And um, uh, when, I, when I was uh, finishing my master's program in spiritual psychology, it was the end of my first year, I wrote a living vision, a five-page living vision. And, and the next morning I woke up with the word Stargate Alliance in my mouth. And I, I hadn't really understood what that was. It took me a few days to understand. And within three months, I was invited to participate in production of a documentary called Secrets of Love. We released through Beyond Words in 2012. And it's, um, uh, it's a documentary exploring relationships as a catalyst for evolution and love, particularly within relationships, any type of relationships. But, um, and from there, uh, I, I was invited to create a peace platform called, Star, uh, called uh, Peace Link Live. And I was just the founding executive member of, of that. And then from there, um, the music came through. And uh, it's interesting because I was producing work and I ended up producing a song that came through me. And now I am my own, <laughs> I'm singing under my own label. It's a very confusing process, but um, I actually ran away from it when it came through. I didn't want to, you know, I said, no, I just created this for the documentary I'm creating. Because my passion is to really uh, reawaken the divine feminine. It's one of the, the threads through which my work is being guided, you know. And I, I feel like I'm seriously being guided by um, this divine feminine present that appeared to me back in 2003 when I had a huge awakening around that time. And, um, and it revealed itself to be the goddess of compassion, Kuan Yin. At the time, I didn't really know who she was. And she was appearing to me in dreams and visions. And um, my life had been turned upside down and completely rearranged. And um, Excuse me, may I ask you, what do you remember of that time in your life? Well, I remember um, that things just started. I was doing a prayer, okay? This is what happened. I felt all my life I was extremely connected to spirit. I was a very mystic little child. I grew up in Brazil, and I was very curious about the nature of reality, um, the architecture of spiritual world. I grew, around, I grew up around mediums and trans-channelers. I had an aunt who could um, channel, you know, a lot of entities and speak in tongues and things like that. And that created an acute sense of curiosity. And then around age nine, eight or nine, I had an, an out-of-body experience where I found myself in the void. Yeah, and um, I was so terrified that I never talked about it for many years, but I... In that process, I just uh, was taken out, and I saw the earth, and then I saw all people disappearing, and then I only saw nature, and then nature disappeared, and then the planet popped, and then I kept going back, back, and I could see the whole star system, you know, and little by little, every planet continued to disappear. 
and then galaxies disappeared and I found myself completely alone in the dark and I thought to myself, this must be where God is. And, uh, and I wasn't afraid, you know, and I kept, my consciousness kept asking questions as if, you know, I was asking questions. It wasn't really, but I had, I was awake. It was the middle of the afternoon. I, I, I just felt guided to walk into my bunk bed and lay down. And I was looking at the ceiling and then this whole thing happened. So, you know, I, I came back to myself and my heart was beating really fast. I sat up in bed and I couldn't remember my name, where I was, what that was. I didn't know the name to anything. I lost identity completely. And, um, and, and then after that, my life was just constantly seeking. You know, I grew up as a teenager. I had no interest in teenagers. I didn't go out and, you know, until much later in my early adult life, I actually tried to experience a little bit of what it is to be young, but I was surrounded by books and I went to every religious sect you can imagine, from the Rosicrucians to the Cardicists to, you know, I used to be part of uh, circles of uh, healing and at the age of 15, 16, I was already in yoga. And, and then I started doing hands-on healing and removing pain from people spontaneously. If, if somebody showed up in my house and they had a headache, I would just put my hands on them and within three to five minutes the pain would be gone. But this was all done very spontaneously, you know, and then um, the search continues. I wanted to find um, a, a common ground to all religions. I, I believe there was only one truth that we would all eventually find, mm -hmm. and that all these paths were leading to one place. Um, but I felt like there was something that needed to be unlocked. There was some secret, something that I was searching, you know. Anyway, and I grew up just, you know, I remember being in the car with my grandfather and looking out the window and not understanding why I was in the car and not in that car or in that car and I couldn't see the eye, the world through other people's eyes. So those experiences continue to be present in my life where I couldn't understand why I was only a single identity. So there was a memory of being able to be everywhere or experience all things, you know, I was yeah, it was a very interesting process. So that curiosity led me to, in later in life, uh, you know, have an interest in metaphysics, psychology, UFO. I researched everything and put my hands in everything, and eventually got married, had kids, and got divorced. And then, the time of the divorce is when I reconnected to my soul. In a sense, I mean, you can't disconnect from the soul, but I guess this is the term that of choice, you know. I just, I forgot who I was for a period of time while I had this, what I call a sacred contract to complete, which had been, when I was 19, okay, I dreamt about my life and what was going to happen. And I saw things, there was an angel that came to me and things that I understood much later. So that's why I understand that period of my life as a soul contract I had to get married and have those kids and then and then once the marriage fell apart is when I felt this avalanche of spirituality rushing in back to me and I felt compelled to do a prayer and it's called prayer of caritas it's a prayer that I heard when I was really young and I used to pray a lot all my life because my mother was Catholic she was Portuguese and she was raised among priests you know, uh, until she was about 12, 13. There were like several priests in the village she was brought up in Portugal. But she didn't force us to go to church. She didn't believe in the church itself. And there's a, a story that goes with that. But just to, to stay on focus here, she taught us every prayer in the book she knew. And I never went to bed without praying all my life. And But during the period of my marriage, I would say that the last, you know, few years, I, I, I was really sort of just going through the motion. 
and I felt that calling to do this prayer. And I prayed, I don't know, for weeks. And the first thing I did when I woke up in the morning before I put my foot on the ground was to do that prayer. And before I went to bed and fall asleep, I would do that prayer. And it was a three page long prayer. Very beautiful, very dogmatic. It's not conscious languaging. It's very, very churchy, but very, very pure. And I think what really matters is the your intention, the energy you put into the purity of your heart when you're doing it. And from that moment on, everything started to shift. The truth got revealed to me really fast, and everything in my life was rearranged. And then I started becoming super sensitive like to the moonlight. I could feel if I if the moon if the full moon was out, I I remember having a skylight in my house and going through it you know, down the steps and passing through and just feeling all the hair in my body raised and I didn't understand what just happened. I would go back up and again, and then I realized that the moon was shining through the skylight. So I went outside and, you know, I was having all these things Then I couldn't eat. I couldn't eat for, for several weeks. Um, just couldn't, um, yeah, I, w I would look at food and, and it would look like plastic to me. So I went into the store and I picked up some greens powder and I would have that twice a day. That's the only thing I could consume is uh, apple juice with, uh, with the greens powder and I would have that a couple times a day. I was actually super healthy. I remember going to the doctor and he took the blood and he examined the blood and he said I've never seen anybody with blood this healthy in my life. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And I didn't want to tell him that I wasn't eating it for weeks and months, you know, and I was just drinking this thing because I couldn't digest food and I didn't have any appetite. But I didn't want to fall ill because I had kids and I was getting separated. and So all these things were coming through and then the dreams, you know, and the signs and all this like symbolic things, people I would meet that would bring me a message about Kuan Yin or a book I would pick up at a store and then you know the dream that um, she appeared in front of me and she had 360 degree uh, head uh, turn and laser eyes and the black birds were flying over my head and she would zap them with her eyes like laser eyes <laughs> it's very powerful <clears throat> and I still didn't know who she was I used to call her Buddha lady the lady and uh, from then on my life you know I finished my USM program uh, spiritual psychology with Ron and Mary Holnick I think uh, they just published their second book now and they've been teaching for over 30 years I don't know if you're familiar with the spiritual psychology program so I graduated from that and in the process of my second year masters I wrote a book uh, that I haven't published yet. It's called Jewel in the Mud. Excuse me, say it again. Jewel in the Mud. Jewel in the Mud. Yeah, an autobiographical guide to seeing the gifts and appreciating the lessons. So it's a revision of life with different eyes where you look at everything bad or good or difficult and you see it from an elevated view and you understand why it happened and you have gratitude instead of sorrow or with such a deep experience throughout your life and this sensitivity, how do you perceive that your music is helping you in your mission? Yeah, this is, this is a very powerful question and um, I feel the music is um, a byproduct of something much greater that is actually informing me as I move along. It's not like I have a plan or I know what I'm doing, but it's definitely, to me, you know, a lot of people say, oh, this music is a gift. I use it in my healings now, you know. I, I had people cry their eyes out, like, for the first time they, they heard it. Sometimes they would say, oh, I heard you you recorded a song, can I hear it? And I said, oh no, I'm just doing this for my documentary on the Divine Feminine. It's not like I'm not a singer. I am not. This is just because I knew the quality of the music needed to be a certain way. And, uh, and they would insist and I would 
I had a resistance because I did not want to be a singer and I still juggle that and I don't actually take the the labels, you know. Some people say, Oh you're a producer I say, No 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 I'm not. You're a singer, no no no. I, I like to be fluid and flowing and just uh, allow spirit to work with me, whatever the next thing is, and not lock myself up and allow, you know, our reasoning mind to create a box for me to live in. I, I have allergy to labels and I don't care how, you know, how appropriate they may be for whatever I'm doing at the time. I just so I feel the music is, is, has a life of its own, you know, it took a life of its own. It ended up in a, in a document, in a, in a film that was just now distributed by uh, 108 Media in Canada and it's, you can actually watch it anywhere now through videos, uh, through media, uh, digital distribution channels like Vulu, Vulu, What's the name? Amazon. It's called The Winter Rose. All the winter rose. A winter rose, and um, yeah, my composer was Troy, who is a phenomenal artist director as well, who directs my videos, and I produce it with him. Uh, it's usually my vision, and he respects that. And um, and um, he's he created this film so he could put my music on because he tried to put my music in other films, and I didn't let him because I, I consider it coming from a very sacred place. And some films were just not the right content. And he said, I'm going to make a movie that you're proud of and I'm going to put the music in it. So he created A Winter Rose. And it's a beautiful film about an orphan girl who has a gift of singing and music. And I think, um, yeah, Teresa Russell is in it. We have uh, Robert Miano and um, um, I'm trying to remember them, terrible with names. Um, uh, Paul Sorvino, whom I love, he gives an, a phenomenal performance. I cry every time I see the film. And, uh, and um, it's a beautiful drama. And now Riz and I are working on a documentary about uh, reseeding the coral reefs in the oceans because everybody has been making movies about how the corals are dying. In, in 2016, we experienced one of the largest extinctions uh, that, that, that humanity has ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds of the coral reef is dead. I think 50 or 60 percent of all coral reefs are dying now or not dead currently. And this is, this is something people don't talk about and you don't hear in the news, but the repercussions are huge. We're going to have uh, the oxygen supply go down. We have uh, social communities in the South Pacific who had depended on their fishing to survive and develop themselves and uh, their uh, children committing suicide or teenagers uh, because part of their emotional development of the young boys was to go out spearfish and there is no fish but we're not being told you know and we found two scientists that are now discovering ways to create you see all of this is connected uh -huh. I don't feel that yes. it's one voice coming through. The music is going to be in this documentary as well. Riz wants to create this vocal, uh, cosmic vocals, and he's very uniquely creative. Beautiful. I would like to ask you a favor before we end our conversation today. And the favor is, I would like you to talk to the, uh, our audience, millions of uh, viewers we have every single day, or every single uh, month. Uh, could you please talk to the people that have not been able to still have their divine feminine relieved and maybe advise them how they could do it. To, to awaken the divine feminine yeah. within them. You know, I believe every, every person has their own unique roadway and path. I don't think there is a formula that fits everyone. Um, I think the best advice I could give to anybody who wants to connect with the Divine Feminine within them is to trust their own inner guidance system, trust the inner voice that speaks to you, and don't wait for permission from anyone else, any authority that you have 
learned that this is the way to do. Um, unless you're dealing with medicine or of course you're not going to start channeling advice for people to cure themselves with medicine or something like that, you know. But listen to the inner guidance uh, that speaks to you, that's available all the time and uh, allow your mind to have less of a say and your heart to speak louder. Sometimes we believe that things have to be done through a certain pathway, a, th a certain roadway, through accomplishing degrees or studying or getting certificates. And sometimes our passion is the most important element to bring forth what is your unique gift to the world. And my example is I've never trained as a musician or as a singer or a producer for that matter. And nonetheless, I'm completely involved in the creation of conscious media and, and music. And uh, if you would ask me many years ago if I would ever be doing this, I would say no, I, I had no idea. And uh, why am I here today? Because I got my head out of the way, I allowed my passion to drive me, and I connected to my spirit, my soul, and everything got delivered. It was almost like they, the carpet got rolled and I just had to thank walk you. through it. Beautiful. Thank you. Kalyani, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank really you, Mike. Amazing. Great. Great thank you very much. You. Again, this is uh, Angel Rebo with Mindalia TV. Thank you very much for, having, for being with us today. Thank you.